Hello, I'm Dr. Tom Allison here at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota, and I'm going to give you a little talk today in our exercise series, and I call this stress testing pearls. I've been doing stress testing for more years than I'd like to remember, and I'm going to share a few cases with you today that I think make important points. Now, I have no relevant financial disclosures, and I'm not going to uh, discuss any off-label usage of medications or devices. The first pearl beyond the ST segment. So here's our case. This is a 67-year-old man. He has no prior history of coronary disease. He has a five-week history of exertional dyspnea occurring at high levels of exertion. The severity is proportional to effort level, and it resolves one minute after stopping. You can see here that he has a number of risk factors for coronary artery disease. Uh, his exam is normal except for an elevated BMI, and his 10-year risk is in the intermediate range. Resting electrocardiogram is unremarkable. Exercise electrocardiogram shows some J-point depression and there's a little bit of baseline variability here, but overall, we did not consider this to be a positive exercise electrocardiogram. But we know that the exercise test is more than just a stress ECG. So we have a number of factors, including aerobic capacity, symptoms, we can calculate a Duke treadmill score. We look at the blood pressure and see what it does. We look at the heart rate and see whether it increases appropriately. And we can look to see whether the heart rate recovers appropriately, being at least 13 beats per minute in the first minute of active recovery. Now, here are the results of our patient compared to normal values for a man his age. You can see his exercise time is poor. Uh, his exercise capacity is limited. He had angina. He had an abnormal Duke score. His chronotropic index was low. In other words, his heart rate didn't go up well. It did not recover well. And he had a very limited blood pressure response. Now, so based on the electrocardiogram, we might think, gee, he probably doesn't have disease, but based on his prognostic indices, it's very likely that he does have significant disease. And let's take a look. Well, you can see he's got a couple of lesions here in the proximal left anterior descending coronary artery that are worrisome. His right coronary also has a lesion in the mid-right. So based on guidelines for appropriateness of revascularization, he has an intermediate risk Duke score, and he has single vest, uh, sorry, two vessel disease, but including the proximal LAD. So revascularization is appropriate and the team decided to proceed with angiography and uh, stented the LAD with two stents and put another drug eluding stent in the mid RCA. He's done well. He's had no events and no recurrence of symptoms since his PCI. On follow up evaluation, you can see exercise time improved to 100% of predicted. His angina disappeared. His Duke score now was a plus 8.6. The chronotropic index, which should be at least 0.8, was now in the normal range. His heart rate recovery got significantly better, and he got an excellent blood pressure response compared to his very limited blood pressure response before. First pearl summary, the exercise test is more than just a stress ECG. Performance, symptoms, and hemodynamic responses 
must also be taken into account in interpreting the test and determining the appropriate course of action. Here's our second case, our second pearl beyond 10 METs. So we have a 62-year-old man sent for a screening exercise test. He's also in the intermediate risk range, principally because of his age. He does, however, have a positive family history. Both brother and father had MIs in their 50s. His exam is normal. You can see his resting electrocardiogram shows an early repolarization variant, and he has not, not really high voltages, but somewhat prominent voltages, suggesting maybe there's an athletic heart here. Prognostic signs, exercise time, exercise capacity, no angina, a high Duke score, which is good, a good high heart rate response, a vigorous brisk heart rate recovery, and a good blood pressure response. The exercise ECG, however, shows significant abnormalities at the peak exercise, but these have all disappeared by 15 seconds of active recovery. So we sometimes label this running artifact this is due to the twisting and turning of the heart as it beats vigorously. Uh, and even with a little bit of slowdown, this seems to normalize. So we might ask ourselves, does this patient have coronary artery disease based on the exercise ECG? Well, maybe it's a toss up. Uh, do we pay attention to the peak or do we pay attention to the recovery? Uh, based on the prognostic indicators, however, it's very unlikely that he has coronary artery disease and simultaneous myocardial perfusion imaging was completely normal. Uh, there are several papers showing that achieving a workload of greater than or equal to 10 METs on a stress test uh, shows a very low risk of inducible ischemia uh, and that the exercise electrocardiogram is not particularly sensitive or specific in these cases. So our second pearl summary, use of the exercise test to determine prognosis is neither endorsed nor not endorsed by the ACC AHA risk assessment guidelines. Use of the exercise test for diagnostic screening of asymptomatic patients is not endorsed, uh, and the exercise ECG interpretation is unreliable at high levels of exercise, particularly when patients are running on the treadmill and at high heart rates. Okay, let's go to the third pearl, and this is called Beyond the Bruce Protocol. So our case is an endurance athlete, 44 years of age, and he's hoping to compete again in the American Berkebiner five, uh, I'm sorry, 50 kilometer freestyle cross country ski race. And you see he has no cardiovascular history, no risk factors, exormal, a normal cardiac exam, but he claims of fatigue during cross country ski races very low 10-year risk, okay? So last year, for example, he was doing fine for about 35 minutes with the leaders at 12 kilometers. He then began to struggle. He would slow down and stop, start up again. He'd recover during the stop, and, and then he would, he would begin to struggle again his time decreased from 2.23 to 3.22, almost a full hour from one year to the next. The resting ECG, again, somewhat prominent voltages. He is an endurance athlete. Uh, a few PACs are noted. 
cardiopulmonary exercise tests, completely normal, heart rate 171 at peak exercise, no symptoms, no fatigue, a good VO2 max, even though he's in the off season. Pre and post spirometry, normal, no exercise asthma. Oxygen consumption increases continuously, as does oxygen pulse during the test. His electrocardiogram showed a few more PACs and peak heart rate was 171. So where do we go now? We have failed to reproduce his symptoms. Should we do a 24-hour halter, a loop recorder, a EP study? How about another exercise test uh, that's a little bit different than the one we just, than the standard Bruce protocol? Uh, and uh, maybe, maybe at this point we say, hey, this isn't your heart, let's refer him somewhere else. Well, we chose to do the special exercise test. We tried to reproduce race conditions and to elicit his symptoms. So we started him running at seven miles an hour with a 5% grade, increased this to eight miles an hour after 25 minutes. At 34 minutes of exercise, his heart rate suddenly shot up to 206 beats per minute and the rhythm was irregular. He slowed to walk and sinus rhythm was restored. Back to running, back into atrial fibrillation uh, with a high heart rate and an irregular uh, rhythm. Okay. Now, atrial fibrillation in cross-country ski racers has interestingly been well documented. This is a paper from Anderson in the European Heart Journal looking at about 53,000 cross-country ski race finishers and uh, there were 681 cases of atrial fibrillation risk of atrial fibrillation increased with the number of races completed, meaning basically the number of years of training and how serious the athlete was about training and a faster finishing time uh, predicted a higher risk of atrial fibrillation. There was a similar relationship for symptomatic bradycardia, 119 cases. So, this athlete elected for an ablation, and, and here you can see post-ablation, a, a premature beat coming in, uh, but not being conducted any further because of the pulmonary vein isolation. Um, at um, one month post-ablation, we saw him, he was doing fine. Um, seven years later, Saw him again, no recurrence of atrial fibrillation, no complications, and um, he resumed his high-level performance in the uh, Berke Biner and Classic and other races. So again, the third Pearl summary. Bruce protocol is not generally applicable to athletic performance. It's important to try to reproduce the symptoms if possible, and this often requires a specialized protocol. Now, my fourth and final pearl, beyond conventional risk factors. So this is a 49-year-old man reporting exertional chest pain, uh, and he gets it, it's really left-sided and shoulder pain, and he gets it on the elliptical trainer. So. Maybe it's, maybe it's orthopedic here, musculoskeletal. He has no family history of early CAD. He has no CAD risk factors, at least not traditional risk factors. Normal cardiac exam, uh, BMI 28.5, but most of that's really muscle in this guy. Very low 10-year risk, not quite as low as our skier, but, but 
considerably low risk. He has a normal resting electrocardiogram, but his performance is compromised. Exercise capacity, only 66% are predicted. He has ST changes on the electrocardiogram, which I'll show you in a minute. His heart rate increases to 85%. Uh, heart rate recovery is only 12. It's slightly impaired. And his blood pressure actually drops with peak exercise. He has angina and a Duke score of minus 12. And here you can see the exercise electrocardiogram. It doesn't look particularly good. Now, is this going to be another one of those that snaps back in 15 or 30 seconds? Well, no, you can see out six minutes into passive recovery, the patient is still symptomatic and has marked ST depression with downsloping configuration. Does he have coronary artery disease? Very likely, yes. Uh, what information did I withhold? History of Hodgkin's lymphoma, treated with radiation with extended fields 20 years prior to the current presentation. So uh, he has an 80% proximal and 60% distal left main lesions. His right coronary artery which is not in the radiation field, did not show any significant disease. I'll let that play again. And uh, at the time of the angiography, they also looked at the lima to make sure that it was going to be a good conduit and wasn't compromised itself because it was also uh, in the radiation field. So he went on to have three-vessel coronary artery disease with a graft, a lima to the LAD, and vein grafts to the first diagonal and first obtuse marginal. Fourth pearl, beyond conventional risk factors. Traditional coronary risk factors do not explain all coronary artery disease. Exertional symptoms are always worrisome, and should be evaluated. Chest irradiation can cause coronary disease, restrictive lung disease, valvular heart disease, conduction disorders, and uh, in the past, in particular, um, when doses were higher, chronic pericarditis. I conclude with the following. Evaluating a patient with cardiac symptoms and comorbidities is a lot like evaluating a used car. The exercise test is the test drive. Looks aren't everything. You got to get behind the wheel and fire it up before you decide to buy the car. Thank you very much for your attention.